Welcome to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. We feature top entrepreneurs and thought leaders from around the world, those who bring a global mindset and a unique perspective to their life and business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, this is David Nilsson here. I am the host of this podcast. Um, on the Future is Borderless, we connect with business leaders from around the world who have what I like to refer to as a borderless mindset. Uh, and the purpose of this is to share ideas and innovations, um, best practices that will just help us continue to grow both personally and professionally uh, and allow us to continue to evolve in a rapidly uh, changing world. Now, this episode is brought to you by Doxa Talent. Doxa helps businesses to source full-time, highly skilled workers from all over the world. And as a result, these companies can scale faster, increase margin, and improve culture. And they provide everything from accountants, sales development reps, virtual assistants, and even software engineers to publicly traded companies and local small businesses. If you want to learn how to grow your business with offshore professionals, simply visit doxatalent.com. All right. Well, I'm excited for today's show um, uh, because we're going to do um, talk about something that I think is very important to every business owner and something that we all need and love, and that's revenue. Um, our guest today is Matt Hines. He's the president and founder of Hines Marketing. And he brings about 20, 20 years of marketing and business development uh, and even sales experience from a variety of organizations and industries. Uh, Matt is an author of many books, including Full Funnel, Market, Full Funnel Marketing, excuse me, uh, and regularly speaks at national stages such as Salesforce's Dreamforce and the Marketo User Summit. Uh, when you see him, which I have, Matt is memorable, not only because of the content and humor that he he sort of provides from the stage, but also the actionable and even motivating takeaways. Uh, and Matt uh, also is the host of the Sales Pipeline Radio, which is a weekly show that um, sort of highlights best practices and actionable insights for sales and marketing pros. So I'm going to do my best to actually control the conversation and not let him take over since he's used to being in this seat. Uh, but Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And I, I'm, you know, you're a Seattle guy, so go Huskies. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I, as I understand it, you started your career at Microsoft, but I, you know, it's funny, like I I've actually known Matt uh, for a little while, but I don't know the backstory of Heinz marketing and how that sort of came about and what your vision is for the company. So I wonder if we could maybe start there. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so I actually, uh, before Microsoft, I started as a journalist. I studied journalism and political science at UW and my first job out of school, I was a re reporter for the Bremerton Sun, had the state government beat. So I was doing what I wanted to do except for I got into it and didn't really love it. And so ended up at a PR firm for a while, then went to Microsoft, left Microsoft to run marketing at a couple of Seattle startups and eventually just decided I kind of wanted to try to do my own thing. Had no intention of running a business. Um, I come from a fairly risk adverse family, no entrepreneurs. I, my, my mom and dad both had the same job for essentially 35 years. So like they didn't even change jobs, it was just the same place, right? <laughs> so um, like when I told them I was leaving the newspaper to go to a PR firm, they weren't, they were supportive, but they said like, but you chose your career in college. Like why you're sticking with that? Why? So not a lot of, you know, risk taking. So I, you know, I didn't intend to start a business. I just kind of kind of decided to sort of try to do my own thing. It was me, a laptop and a bus pass 14 years ago to get started and just some natural growth from that point. And then eventually tried to figure out how to actually grow and lead a business. And so it's been a lot of baptism by fire, Dave. It's been just figuring out, um, at different stages, like what's needed. And for sure, the EO experience and the EO community has been instrumental in not only helping me see what might be coming, but also give me some of the skills and confidence to say, maybe I can run a business. Maybe I can grow something that can be successful and have an impact on not only our clients, but the community around it. Yeah. So, so help me go one step further. Cause you know, when we talk about sales and marketing, it's a pretty broad topic. Um, there's a lot of uh, places where uh, agencies and consultants and, and organizations play. Like, what is it that you actually do and who is your um, core customer? Yep. Uh, we work entirely with B2B companies and mostly with those where marketing wants to embrace a level of revenue responsibility that they may not previously had. We describe that as revenue responsible marketing that generates predictable pipeline for growth phase organizations. So if you have a marketing department that may kind of act and operate like the arts and crafts department, right? Lots of activity, lots of pretty pictures, logos on pens, um, maybe even generating some leads, but not really thinking about the revenue output of their efforts. And even if they're thinking about like, hey, I need to generate pipeline too often, that pipeline is lumpy, 
right? Like there's a conference next this month and not next month. Well, that's great for this month's pipeline, but your sales team is starving the next month. So the best marketers in B2B are thinking with a revenue mindset and they're developing systems and programs that deliver predictable, repeatable, and scalable pipeline to their organization. So we're, we, I think of ours as a teaching organization that can come in and bring our methodologies and customize those to a company's opportunity, culture, and market and teach them how to run a more revenue responsible marketing department moving forward. You know, it's funny. You can tell you've been doing this for a long time because it just rolls off the tip of your tongue. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Well, I, you know, I'm going to take a minute and just want to ask a couple of questions that I think are relevant to a lot of people. But honestly, these are things that I've struggled with in every business that I've ever had, which is when to invest in brand and when to mm. invest in like demand or demand gen, mm. right? Like, there, you know, how do you think about the intersection of those two? And, you know, when you're a young business versus a mature business, like, is there a is there a particular recipe for how you should invest between those? It's a really great question. Uh, I, historically, I've always thought that you you earn the right to invest in brand by investing first in demand, right? You have to close business. You have to have some revenue to be able to sort of have the runway to go and build brand. If, if you spend time up front, if the first thing you do is hire a PR firm, an ad agency, and get your name known in the market, but you build no pipeline, like... As you and I both know, like cash is king as you grow your business. So if you've generated a bunch of funding and you say like, I got a four-year runway and I'm going to invest in brand that's going to give a halo effect and subsidize the cost of our, our direct marketing, fine. But you better hope you actually have that four-year runway. And I think as we record this in 2022, a lot of companies are starting to run out of that runway, right? Um, that said, where I've come on this is I think you can do both. Uh, as you grow, especially early stage, if you invest first in how well you understand your customer, two ways. One, who is your target market? Like if you sell into healthcare, it's not all of companies in healthcare, right? There's a difference between your total addressable market and what I think of as your serviceable, obtainable market. What's the subset of the subset of your market that are companies that are best suited to buy from you that most likely have the need that are more likely to be actively buying in the near future? Like that you start with. And then because buildings don't write checks, who are the people in those organizations? Who are the different people with a vested interest in the outcome you represent? And what do they care about? Independent of you, right? You earn the right for them to care about you by you caring about them first. Don't ask them what keeps them up at night. Ask them what keeps ask their excuse me, don't ask them what, keep, what keeps them up at night. Tell them what should be keeping them up at night because you know so well and you know so much about that audience, right? And so if you do that well, the content you create, the offers you create, while they are intended to drive demand, have some consistency in terms of the message they provide. And so it's not just get a demo, get a demo, get a demo. It's I'm educating you on a problem you did or didn't know exist. So for those that are actively buying, you're likely to get a response. From those not actively buying, they're saying, wow, that was decent content. I'd like to see more from that company. Your demand marketing, your content can go from being ir interruptive to being irresistible. And so you're building brand, you're building equity with that audience while you are building demand. Yeah, I love it. You got some good nuggets. That, like <laughs> you got these like little phrases that you use. I, I think it's awesome. I, I think I, I hope somebody says the same thing about me someday. Um, let me ask you a question. In, in your business, how much of it is geared towards B2C versus B2B? We are entirely B2B. Yeah, B2B. No, everything we do is B2B. It's just, it's it's what I grew up doing at Microsoft, What I the companies I went to afterward. Um, I always joke that like consumer, consumer's too hard, right? Consumer's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's you, it, 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 the consumer marketers, and you think about the way that the database marketers do it for Target and for Amazon and others, it's very high, high level of complexity. Um, B2B marketers are getting there, which is good. Uh, it's just what I'm comfortable and familiar with. That said, it's even if you're selling to a Fortune 50 company, it's still people like you and me that are making decisions, right? It's crazy busy people that you know should be making logical decisions for the company, but oftentimes are making emotional decisions based on what they need as well. So it's humans you're selling to, and I think too often if you look at like B2B sales and marketing materials, it is way too formal. It is way too much about a business interest. It doesn't address the person that you're selling to. So that's where elements of consumer marketing, I think, apply directly to successful B2B sales and marketing as well. Yeah. Well, I, I think part of the reason I asked the question is there's, I, there's um, 
you know, COVID obviously it, it sort of pushed the world in a direction. It was already sort of moving in this sort of remote environment. Uh, yeah. COVID sort of accelerated that that shift, but now it seems like companies are uncertain about who they're going to be. Like, am I full remote? Am I come, bringing people mm-hmm. back to the office? Am I in hybrid uh, environment? And I had this situation just the other day where we wanted to send a handwritten thank you card to a couple hundred of our clients. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we realized uh, we don't we don't <laughs> have their addresses because we would yeah. typically send theirs to the office, but there's yeah. a very high likelihood they're no longer there. So I'm just curious, like, now, when you think about how people are activating their sales and marketing efforts, like how has that shifted, and 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 you know, what are you consulting people on to sort of think about that? Yeah, I mean, well, in the midst of the pandemic, you know, there if if you ha- if you were building a relationship with some trust from the beginning, people were willing to give you their address, right? Especially in the sort of shelter-in-place world, like checking the mail was a highlight of the day, right? And so, <laughs> getting something in the mailbox or like, hey, there's a box coming in the next couple of days. I don't know what it is, but something's coming. So people are like, yeah, sure, I'll give you my address. But if they trust you, right? Like, are they going to spend an hour with you if they don't know you and trust you? We have probably all, if you, everyone watching, listening, I mean, we've all had the bait and switch of someone where you thought you were going to get something valuable and turned into a sales pitch, right? Um, that's not valuable. That's not trust. Um, there have been a number of companies that have created virtual experiences very successfully. I remember during the pandemic, um, Ethan Stoll, you know, did it here in Seattle. You know, he did a number of programs where he would send people a package that included a steak and all the fixins. And he would on on screen like do he would do how to cook a steak. And in some cases, it was like you could bu- you could buy as an advertiser, as a marketer, you could buy that package and give it to your VIPs. So your VIPs, your best prospects get to like stay at home, ask questions of Ethan Stoll. So for those who are not in Seattle, like he's a big deal here. He's like, you know, has a bunch of restaurants kind of a celebrity chef here in Seattle. So that was a draw. Uh, Another company was invented right out of the the pandemic called Purple Cork. And all they do is virtual wine tasting. So they have partnered with high-end niche wineries um, and they package and send them out to prospects. And they get B2B companies that want appointments with executive decision makers and say, we've got exclusive wine you can't get anywhere else, right? We will send you two bottles. And we're, and the best companies that do this don't do a pitch in that meeting, right? If you, if you take someone to the Super Bowl historically, if you take someone golfing historically, that's about trust and rapport building. You will have a chance later to have the business conversation. And if you've taken them golfing or to the Super Bowl or a couple of bottles of wine, they're more likely to say yes, if they feel like that experience was worth it. So, you know, I think that we, I see a lot of companies say, I can't mail people anymore. I can't call people anymore. You can do both. You have to earn people's trust, right? There is no fast forward to just immediately getting someone's attention and all the attention you want. Doesn't it it also come down to intent though? Because I I hear when you say like those investments that you make in a longer term relationship, you should Mm -hmm. approach those thinking like, this is not my opportunity to sell. This is my my opportunity to sort of develop a relationship that may be fruitful long-term. But what I've found is that anytime I've done that, the person that I'm treating starts to ask questions. They start to right. sort of warm up and it, 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 it sort of opens up a conversation that isn't selling, but mm-hmm. actually it's just about developing relationship and educating. So hundred percent. I, um, so, you know, it, another thing born out of the pandemic, sort of, I manage this CMO network and it's a Slack group and a group that meets every Friday morning. And what started with 24 chief marketing officers is now almost 2000 in an active Slack community, about 350 rotating folks will meet on a Friday morning. We do not pitch. There are people in that group that don't know what my company does at all. They just see me in and around the community. But I want to provide so much value to those folks where they're like, who are you and why are you doing this? Like, what do you do for a living? You invite that conversation. But to your point about intent, I think also this isn't just about getting people into a Slack group or to the Super Bowl or to you know a steak cooking party. It's who are the people you invited and why are they there? There was a um, a sales readiness uh, study done a couple of years ago by Gartner that seems to have held up pretty well. Held up pretty well across B two B industries. They said, "Who is buying?" And across B two B industries, they found that three or four percent of companies were actively buying. I mean, they know they have a problem, they're committed to change, and they're exploring solutions. Forty six percent of the of the market is what Gartner called poised. They have the need, they just aren't pursuing it today for right or wrong reasons. They may have accurately triaged other things, 
They may not know that there's a problem. They may not have quantified the problem. And what this implies is there's a whole 50% of your market you should not be spending time on, right? Um, and so again, like people sometimes say like my top, the biggest hundred companies in my industry are my top targets. Maybe not if you think about the criteria and the intent signals that exist with the companies and the individuals to say, who should I be engaging to begin with? Yeah, I love that. So tell me, um, let's talk a little bit about you as a leader. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about marketing, but you know, you have this, this business. I know it's been growing. You guys are doing very, very well. You know, if you think back to uh, what year did you start it, by the way? Uh, 2008. Okay. So 2008, think about Matt Hines, 2008 to today. Like how have you evolved as a leader? Like how have you changed the way that you not only lead the organization, but maybe even your role within it? Oh, well, I'm asked changed dramatically. I, I, I still, um, I still think back to some of my early days as a manager. This is back at, I was an individual contributor at Microsoft. So the startups, I started managing people and I still think back to some of those days and I cringe. I literally want to go on an apology tour and try to find the people I used to manage and say, I'm really sorry for doing what I did for acting the way I did. I mean, I was trying to do the right thing and I was, I was, uh, I was selfish um, I was trying to look good to my bosses. I just, I you know, was making all the mistakes in the book as a manager. And, you know, when I started, it was just me. It was an individual contributor as a consultant. Um, and, and I think, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, cause I was in a group of, as a group of CMOs, we were complaining about founders and complaining about CEOs. And, uh, you know, if you're a founder of any business, like by definition, it is your baby. I mean, it literally, if, if, if you're an entrepreneur, like it is your baby, it feels like a child. Um, you've done all of the work. Like when you started, you did all of the jobs. You have a very explicit vision for what you are doing and how it's done. And as you grow the business, you will hit a ceiling very quickly if you don't relinquish some of that control. Yeah. If you don't hire good people and get out of their way, if you don't realize what you are good at and what you are not good at, and sort of get out of the way of people that are way better at you than doing things. And one of the best things that helped me years ago was at an EO retreat where we went through an exercise of finding your genius zone. And it really helped me. I mean, I knew that I didn't like back office stuff and I knew the finance and IT and the rest of that. Even, even quite honestly, like even managing people, I've never felt like I was very good at. But the idea of like, okay, like what am I really good at that I'd like to keep doing? And so I've really over the last few years worked to get myself more into my genius zone more often to find great people inside the organization, ideally, they can step up, but you know, outside that fit our values and give them opportunities to succeed and grow, build wealth, be successful in their own right, but honestly, selfishly, take that work off my plate yeah. <laughs> so that I can focus on the things that I think I'm actually good at. That's amazing. I know, um, so I know the genius zone. Lex mm -hmm. Sisney is the author of organizational physics. That's, that is the, the system that he, he's built and he actually speaks on. I know he's done a lot of EO presentations. He was actually our first host or first guest on this podcast. Oh, wow. um, so it's just an amazing, uh, that's funny to connect the two of those. I'll have to send you a link to that later. But um, you said, you know, this is really your baby. And I was thinking to myself, you know what they say about kids? They say it takes a village. Uh, yeah. the, the same is true about a business, right? Like yeah. it takes, it takes a whole community of people to really help uh, grow that uh, long term. So I, I love well, and the analogy is direct too. I think, you know, as a, if, as you grow your business, you have, I mean, you can still sort of help guide its direction and culture and, and purpose, but you have to relinquish control and trust other people. And I think as you grow children and you have to do the same, like my oldest is 13. I got nine, 11 and 13 year old kids. My daughter is in eighth grade. She's wonderful. And there are places with all of our kids that, you know, you want as a parent, you want to step in and help. You want to step in and fix. You want to step in. But there's a lot of situations where they need to learn. You give them guidance, you give them values, you give them help if you need it, but they're going to learn how to be independent of you and to be and to succeed and to to move on and have their impact on the world, not by you helicoptering around them, but by you giving them the foundation they need, giving them a set of objectives and saying, off you go, right? And let me know where I can help. Yeah, totally true. Let's talk, uh, just, I want to go back to, you know, our audience here. So some of them are going to be startup uh, entrepreneurs, maybe early in their life cycle, some are going to be more mature businesses. But you know, the one thing that I always struggle with when we have new initiatives, and I'm going to have to resource a team to that is, do I hire the captain first or the crew? And so I'm, you know, think about marketing. This is a place where you can hire, you can spend a lot on a really strategic uh, executive, 
And sometimes you just need that person to sort of help with demand gen, as we talked about, you know, earlier. And so, mm-hmm. you know, how do you think about that for younger businesses? Do you invest in that captain or do you start to build the crew first? Well, I want to talk about the end game first, because I think most businesses that continue to grow need to have the core competency of revenue responsible marketing in-house. I think there was a day when a lot of the execution and even strategy was outsourced to agencies. We're seeing that shift now to companies saying, as we grow, we need that to be part of our DNA. Investors want to see that. Private equity firms want to see that. Buyers want to see that you are not dependent on some outside group, that you can actually do this yourself, that you have that discipline, you have those processes. When you're getting started, I think it's dangerous to start with a senior marketing leader or even a senior sales leader because you bring that person in who's got that level of experience, unless they're a player coach, unless they're willing to get their hands dirty and have shown that they're willing to do it, you've got an expensive person that's going to immediately want to spend more money on a team to go do the things you need done. So I think as you as a founder, you as a leader should have a sense of what your go-to-market motion should be. I think every founder should be salesperson number one. If you don't know as a founder what your sales process is, if you don't know who your target audience is, again, serviceable, obtainable market, as well as who to talk to and what to say, how can you possibly hire someone who's just going to come in and invent it? You have to be able to give them some kind of a playbook. And I believe you start by hiring people that are going to execute that work, right? You start with people that can take you, a founder, out of the sales and marketing process, that can take your playbook replicate it without you and then make it better and scalable. And, and you may be then the, you know, the virtual VP of marketing or the virtual CMO. But once you've got that system humming, then I think you can bring in a senior leader to optimize it and grow it. So yeah, I, I think in those functions, I'm usually not a fan of bringing on the senior people first. It's too expensive and, and doesn't generate the immediate res- results that you need. Yeah. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've done that historically with our businesses. I've done both actually, where you hired the the, the captain first, but it takes a long time to generate that ROI because inevitably you hire the captain, then you got to go out and find the crew anyways, right? So I think a lot of times with founders in particular, they have a good sense for where they want to take the business. They just need an additional capacity to do that. Um, similarly, I have a question about social media. I mean, this is something that uh, I still feel like people are really confused about. And mm-hmm. I did a quick check before uh, we did this just to kind of look at your following. It looks like you have about 50,000 followers on LinkedIn, 100K uh, on Twitter. So clearly you're doing something right. Strategically, how do you think about the role of social media in a business? Um, uh, and as, as for you as a thought leader, or maybe a better question is like, where do you see people really falling down in that? Um, you know, social media is a long game, right? I mean, we talked earlier about brand versus demand. I mean, social media is not a demand channel. Uh, I see some people say like, well, I'm doing these TikTok ads and I'm getting a lot of leads. You're not getting leads. You're getting clicks. You're getting followers. Followers are not leads. This doesn't mean these are people that are going to immediately buy from you. I think social media can be a highly efficient and highly effective thought leadership tool. Uh, It can be a highly effective, effective competitive differentiator. Um, It can be a great accelerator of your content and, 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 um, and building awareness and intent from your prospects. Um, But that's a long game. You know, I think, um, you know, I've been doing this for 14 years and, you know, uh, you know, followers don't come out of nothing. I mean, you can go, you know, buy followers from somewhere, some sweatshop somewhere in Southeast Asia, I guess. But that's not real numbers. You know, I see people say like, oh, I got this many clicks on my our views on my. Are those real people that you want to sell to? I'd rather have a smaller number of people that I can actually sell to than a million people that just view but have no interest in buying anything ever or nowhere near my interest in market. But I would say like this, the key to doing social well has nothing to do with the channels. It's not about TikTok versus Instagram versus LinkedIn, although choosing your market, your channel mix is important based on who you're selling to. It's about content and consistency. What message do you have that's valuable? I mean, I mentioned earlier sort of this going from interrupted to being irresistible. Like what what kind of message, what kind of voice do you have that people can't wait to hear more, right? In small snippets and snackable pieces of content and and consistency wise, like you just do that every day. Like you just, you have a regular drumbeat. Um, I mean, I've built a nice following, but I didn't intend to build a following, A. B, I just do it every day, right? Like there's content I'm posting on LinkedIn almost, you know, on multiple times a week. I'm responding and engaging with other people there. I've been building content and engaging with an audience on Twitter for like 15 years. 
So it just some of that just takes time. Now, sometimes like you get you get a press clipping or something happens and you can see an acceleration of that. But it's really about the right content for your audience and then a consistent slow build in the right channels that your audience is engaging in and doing that over time. I mean, it's a very simple formula. It just takes a level of investment and discipline to do it well. Yeah. To your point though, there are, the, you know, it's, it's hard not to get trapped in the vanity metrics. That's what I always yep. call them. Right. Cause I, yep. you know, so I, I recently saw a report from, I sit on a board and somebody came back and said, we had a hundred, it was, um, I want to say it was um, uh, 500,000 impressions. That was, mm -hmm. that was the number that they were sharing. It's like somebody sort of saw it maybe, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it yeah. doesn't really mean anything at the end of the day. And, but it is, but they are big numbers and they sound exciting and uh, it's hard to resist those. They sound great. I mean, it sounds like a big number. It may not, it may not be a big number. Maybe that's an average number, right? Like even on LinkedIn, it's like, what's a good number of impressions on a LinkedIn post? Is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? Is it 10,000? But like, how many beers can you buy with those numbers? Zero, right? And so anything you do with content, anything you do with social is a leading indicator is a building block towards building demand and building pipeline and closing some deals so you can buy some beer. But I agree with you. I think it's it's so easy to get enamored with what I sometimes refer to as the marketing of more, more clicks, more likes, more retweets, even leads. I mean, you can say, oh, I got a, I got a thousand people that downloaded my white paper. Well, I mean, I look across my website, we got a bunch of things you can download. The percent of leads that that, that actually have are, are represent people that can buy something from me is small single digits on those downloads, right? They, people come from all over the web. A dentist in South Carolina who wants my content marketing best practice guide. Great, take it, read it, benefit from it. I don't have anything to sell a dentist in South Carolina. That's not my market, right? So, you know, I could argue like it's free for him to take it. Yeah, but I had to pay a server fee somewhere. So that all starts to add up. So you really do need to think about, okay, those metrics are cool, like click-throughs are cool, but if you aren't seeing down the line results that represent a, le a path to revenue, why are you doing it? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. How, um, I, what other mistakes? I mean, we're talking about social media here for a second, but like, what are some of the other things that you see business owners commonly make mistakes in when you think about the you know, sales and marketing funnels? Um. Like a couple of hot takes. One is is hiring for industry expertise. Um, a lot of times you say, oh, I'm going to go hire someone that's been in this industry for 20 years. They got a Rolodex. They know what they're doing. They know all the people. Um, yes, they have a Rolodex. Yes, they know all the people. A relationship with someone doesn't mean that that person's ready to buy. A relationship with someone doesn't mean that that company is actually in your serviceable, obtainable market. And Rolodexes have a shelf life, right? So what someone's Rolodex was effectively 10 years ago, a lot of those people moved on. They've retired. They're no longer buyers. And then also, if all you're doing is working your Rolodex, you're just hoping that those relationships last as long as that salesperson is going to last with you. More important to me than really, than than the deep industry expertise is a process. Who should we sell to? Who are we talking to? What message should we have in front of them? A relationship helps, right? If you already have a relationship with someone, maybe you're more likely to get them an answer to the phone or them to take a meeting with you at a, at a conference. But if that you have a relationship and you buy someone a couple beers, but you don't have something compelling to offer, you're done, right? So I think assuming that the industry expertise is going to work itself is, is one mistake. Um, you know, I think the other is assuming that a volume-based sales strategy is going to work. There are some books that, that have methodologies uh, around predictable revenue and sort of these activity-based selling motions that may have worked 15, 20 years ago. Um, but now everyone's using it and it's annoying as I'll get out to the buyers that are engaging with it. And I think if you are building your sales process based on a simple spreadsheet that says, if I make this many calls, I'll get this percent of people to reply and get this many people into a demo. Very few sales processes and buying processes are that straightforward. There's, there's, it's not a straight line. It zigzags all over the place. There's multiple people involved. And even if the math, even if your spreadsheet says, well, if I get one and a half percent conversion on all these calls, I'll profitably get customers. Yes, maybe. But you may have just done scorched earth with that other 98 or 97.5 percent, or I'm not very good at math. 98.5 percent, right? If I'm one and a half, it's a good one. Um, and if you like, if you called those people like four times a week for four weeks, like, do you think they're going to pick up the phone again? <laughs> if you change your strategy, you are working from a disadvantage if you take those strategies and you're working from a deficit and that can be painful and expensive to make up. So, you know, there's, I think 
people constantly looking for like, what's the one thing that's going to work in sales or marketing? And what's the silver bullet that's going to make things work? Boy, I, I wish there was one, right? But you got to put in the work. You got to do it the right way. Yeah. Putting in the work is, uh, is, is a good way to put it. I mean, I, I actually just literally about a month ago was sitting with a, a particular company and they were telling me about their sales and marketing strategy. And, you know, they have warm leads, people that have come to their site and actually requested a particular type of information. And I said, well, what do you do with them? And I was trying to understand their funnel. And the mm -hmm. comment was that they actually called them 10 times. And I was like, over what period of time? They're like, in the first five days. And I was like, 10 Ooh. times, 10. Listen, wow. I, my phone got sold somehow a couple of years ago and I get 20 calls a day from, if I don't recognize the number, I will not pick up. You're just burning up time on the phone. No. So I agree with you, Van. There's a lot of people that still think about it in terms of just number of dials and that's going to drive the entire funnel. And that's not the way that buyers uh, consume these days. So nope. I think that's great feedback. Um, let's talk about remote work for a second. As you know, um, you know, I'm in the talent business. I like to tell people I've started two businesses between them. We currently have about 500 employees and I like to brag, we don't even have a storage closet. Um, I've really leaned into this remote work mm -hmm. strategy. Tell me about uh, how you think about it within your own business and how you manage that with your team. Yeah, it's changed a lot in the last couple of years. You know, we had an office in Redmond, Washington um, up until the pandemic. Uh, we were one year into a three-year lease and we decided it was safer to work from home. And then the governor said it was definitely safer to work from home. And we never went back. Um, you know, thankfully we had someone that was, that did, was growing, wanted physical space, took over our lease. So that was nice. Um, but we have, we went from sort of making some adjustments to maybe going back to now definitely being strategically in permanent remote work environments. And literally yesterday, you know, we, we use EOS as our operating model. And yesterday we had our first quarterly reset where we kind of like talk about what happened, you know, in Q3 and say, set up our rocks and focus for Q4. And it was the first time we've done that fully remote. Usually we have said, okay, we bring everybody in. We've got employees spread out throughout Western Washington, but we would, if we've asked everyone to come in and this time we didn't. And it kind of sucked to be honest. Like I just, I loved being and seeing people. We used to have a culture of people leaving their desks and going to the lunchroom and having lunch together. You know, you build community. You've got, you know, you've got natural mentorship happening in an, happening in an office. Um, we've missed those opportunities, but I now have an employee. I have two employees on the other side of the mountains now. Um, I've got one, I've got some that are looking at, and we've got employees that we're looking at hiring from various places that we couldn't do before. And so I miss the community, but, uh, you know, part of our purpose is to impact the careers and lives of people in our spheres. And one of that groups is employees. And so if someone chooses to work somewhere else and have that flexibility, be close to family, I've lost the, the intimacy of being together, but I've gained their employment with us. I've gained their loyalty with us because we're enabling them to have the life and the lifestyle they want. Um, and I, you know, I, I was talking to some of our some of our leaders and, you know, most of for those of us that are a little older, like we're just so used to those in office things. But one of the things I think we've done well is we've said, OK, if we are going to be fully remote, what are the things that we that were easier in person that are now very hard to do remotely or not as easy to do remotely? And how do we explicitly replace them? So we are missing out on collaboration. Collaboration is harder remotely than it was in person. Um, just team building and team bonding, right? Just community building in an organization and a company is, is, is just more difficult remotely. And then mentorship and learning, the opportunity for people to learn from each other happened in an office space just more naturally than it does. So just by saying those three things are, think, are, are, are harder in a remote environment, we said, what are we going to do proactively to address those? And so I wouldn't say we're perfect in those fronts and we're certainly continuing to sort of learn and improve on what we're doing, but I am fully embraced. I mean, not only just because I don't have to pay a lease anymore, but also I think we are, we are, we can, we can more directly um, fulfill our purpose as a business remotely versus in person now. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. This is, this is a place where um, I have leaned really far in on the remote side and said, Hey, look, well, part of it is we're an inter international business. Mm -hmm. So if I have an office, people are getting left out all over the place, right? And yeah. so while there's some of that sort of osmosis learning and, and team building, team bonding that you talk about it, you know, when you decentralize, it becomes, it actually becomes exclusionary versus inclusionary. And so that's I think, right. I think that's, uh, I think that's a really good, I've always told people, I think that's great for execution. It's harder for collaboration. So mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that you guys have sort of uh, teased out what are the things that you're, you're potentially going to struggle with. And just by bringing visibility to it, you'll manage mm -hmm. it differently. And I, by the way, these are the exact things that we're struggling with as well. So I think it's just a common um, issue. But that being said, I, you know, when I was all in downtown Seattle, 
Mm-hmm. I could only, I could only recruit from a pool that was within mm-hmm. about five to 10 miles of there. Now the world is my oyster. So I think, right. you know, there's trade-offs either way you go. There um, is. Yeah. So t- tell me a little bit about that then. So let's go a little bit further on that. Like, tell me about some of the tools that you guys use, or maybe some of the rhythms that you have in the business that you're using to sort of help compensate for some of these, even knowing that they've got to continue to evolve. So, um, one of the things we started when we were in person is, you know, we, we, we'd always had kind of an employee of the month award from early on. And we said, we want to recognize someone that sort of exhibited our values. And we decided we want to reward more values per month. So we've always had this little Heinze. I don't know if you can see this. It's a picture of a ketchup, plush ketchup bottle with a face, arms, and legs. And okay. that's, that's a real plush doll, by the way, it's actually still, uh, it's still around here somewhere, but we put it on a sticker and every employee has a full size Heinz marketing football helmet. So for those of you that are college football fans, sometimes at the end of games, some teams give helmet stickers to their to their teammates. Like you had a great game. You set a record for rushing yards. Great. You're a third string quarterback, but you were you you helped with morale when we were behind in the third quarter. You get a helmet sticker as well. So every Friday we give out helmet stickers uh, every week. Um, And so the way they are rewarded is we have we use Tiny Pulse, uh, which we love, uh, uses a feedback tool. And in Tiny Pulse, there's a cheers function, right? So you can give a cheers to anyone on the company for any reason. And we on our executive dashboard, we have a weekly cheers goal. And when you give a cheers, you have to tie it to one or more of our core values before you submit it. When you submit it, it goes into a cheers um, channel in Slack. So the entire company sees who got cheered, right? And so on Friday afternoons, I go through all the cheers from the week and I pick out helmet stickers, right? And I find some great examples, big, small, that, that relate to our values. And it's a way for us not only to reinforce the importance of our values, but it's a way to encourage employees to recognize each other for big and little things throughout the week. Um, so that's one. Um, and then we've, we've, you know, we've invested in, uh, we have a team bonding advisory group. Um, that we have enabled uh, four different people on our team across different levels and departments and said, okay, you know, what can we do with a now remote environment to continue to sort of build uh, just community with each other? So, you know, last night we had our, we had our quarterly meeting yesterday and a, a bunch of folks went to a Mariners game. We had people come in from out of town, just go to a Mariners game. We also do weekly uh, happy hour. So every Thursday we do a virtual happy hour. We round Robin, the owner, um, and we play games like you pick a good code names or we do Pictionary. And uh, sometimes it's just like, hey, you know, bring your favorite holiday drink and talk about it. But, you know, some of those are more serious and some are more silly. But I think those are things that help create a culture and community of people that, you know, look, I mean, we got a lot of we got all the work to do, but let's also sort of make sure we've got a rhythm of community enjoyment at the same time. I love it. We actually we don't do it as regularly as you spelled out there. But one, we do these um, sort of. Um, ad hoc meetings where I get a chance to connect with some of our team members that I haven't met from abroad. And Mm -hmm. the last one we did was bucket list backgrounds. And it was like, you got to change your background to something that's a bucket list item. And man, the conversation and some of the like authenticity or, or I would even say vulnerability that came from it, super, uh, super interesting. So it sounds like you guys are doing a lot right there. Uh, I I know we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I just, you know, one thing that I'd love to just ask about is most of the the best leaders that I know are avid learners, uh, mm-hmm. constantly mm-hmm. pushing themselves to get better. Give me an idea of something that you're excited about learning, uh, learning right now, or that you're working on that you know just gives a sense for how you're thinking about you as an individual. Um, I am thinking a lot about uh, work with purpose and work that matters. Um, you know, as we continue to grow, like a year ago when we adopted EOS as our operating system. If someone had asked me, like, we've always been a very values driven organization, but if someone had asked me, what's your purpose? Like, what, what I, I would have said, well, we, we help B2B marketers create, you know, revenue responsible, predictable pipeline. I'm like, okay, that's our niche. That's what you do. That's what we do. But why do we do it? Like, what's the why behind that? And so as we sort of leaned into that and, and we sort of defined that we initially like, so just, just, you know, behind the, behind the scenes, we initially defined it as we want to change the definition of work to impact careers and lives. And over the course of a year, nine to 12 months of sort of living with that, we said, like, it's not really about the work. It's not really about the change first. It's about the impact careers and lives. Like, that is the primary objective. And it's not about change. It's about impact. So we changed it to say we want to positively impact careers and lives by enabling work that matters. And I think I think about that. 
across four different audiences. I think about that. How do we enable that better with our employees? How do we enable that more with our clients? How do we enable that in the B2B marketing community overall? And the one that I'm really fired up is like, how do we use our success as a platform to support those in need to do things that matter? So how do we start to impact the communities in need around us? And so that we do great work, we do, you know, is change making work for our clients. But if we're successful at doing that, we're giving of our money and time and efforts and inspiring others in our community to have an impact on careers and lives around us. And so that to me, that's where I start to get fired up is thinking about what that looks like. And there's things we're doing now and things we're looking at doing next year that I think will, are creating more impact on that. I love it. It's funny, even as you started talking, I could feel myself leaning forward. When you start talking about marketing, I'm interested. We talk mm -hmm. about purpose, I'm engaged. So we'll leave it there. We've been talking to Matt Hines, the president and founder of uh, Hines Marketing. Matt, where can people go to learn more about the work that you do? You know, we're just Hines, H-E-I-N-Z marketing.com. We, you know, if you're interested in sales and marketing stuff, we've got 13 years of blog posts and research and best practice guides. So tons of stuff up there. Um, I'm just Matt at HeinzMarketing.com. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. But if anyone's interested in learning more, or just want, has any questions on what we talked about today, I, you know, whether it's sales or marketing or purpose-driven work, I, I love to talk about it. Awesome. We'll get all that in the show notes. Uh, thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. Be sure to click subscribe to future episodes so you can hear from more top entrepreneurs and thought leaders. And we'll see you again next time 